So we're going to get started. Welcome to the Institute of Design. Welcome to the Institute of Design and the 85th anniversary of ID. Uh, there are some very familiar faces here. I'm super excited that you all came, up, came down here uh, on this day. Uh, for those of you who are joining online, a special welcome to everybody uh, joining us through the stream as well. My name is Anijo Matthew, and I'm the interim dean of the Institute of Design. And I just stepped into this role less than a year ago. So some of you may not know me. So um, uh, I just wanted to let you know that uh, I'm the interim dean. ID is 85 years old today. This is a story that started 85 years ago. We were founded in 1937 on October 19th. Can you believe it? I'm going to start by asking a question. Why do we tell stories? Why are stories so important to us? Stories are the only way that we can externalize experiences. It is our mechanism to build and transfer culture. They help us with what we know and to tell the next generation of users on what they can build with what we know today. As I stepped into the role at ID, I realized that we have never actually told the story of ID's collective impact on the world over the 85 years. Of course, most people know the Moholinaj story, right? I mean, this is how ID was founded, the new Bauhaus, and all of that. But between Moholinaj and today, there were incredible things that happened. But we don't tell those stories. How many of you, for example, knew that Buckminster Fuller taught at ID? Well, a handful. Patrick knows, of course. <laughs> now, Alec, who wrote the biography of uh, Buckminster Fuller, says that the, I, without ID students, his iconic geodesic dome wouldn't have been possible. Did you know that Massimo Vignelli actually did a little stint at ID? Massimo Vignelli, the person who actually designed the subway map of New York. In 1990, a group of ID faculty members and students got together with Larry Keeley at Dublin on a project that was sponsored by Amoco, during which the first concepts of human-centered design was established. This is way before IDEO started talking about design thinking. And Chuck Owen was experimenting with computers way before designers even knew the word computers. This is the story of ID. We designers have a problem. We are so focused on the future that we often forget to talk about our past. And because we do not tell the story, we don't have the guiding lights that guide us into the future. Or we tend to be modest and let our work talk for us. For those of you who know me, you know that I'm neither modest or I don't hesitate to talk. So I believe being modest and being vocal are two different things. We stand on the shoulders of giants, some of whom are sitting here in, with us, and some of whom are joining online. And I can tell you, the view from up here is amazing. And not many design schools can claim it. The best design schools cannot claim this. Most of them do so much more with so much less than we do. So today, I want to welcome you to this exhibition. But the exhibition isn't about these giants. Sorry, the giants in the room. It's about the unsung heroes, the students, the faculty, the people behind the giants who made this work happen, who defined the four eras of ID. We intentionally chose not to define those heroes, but the work. I want you to partake in this story. This is our story. Mine and yours. The story of so many people who went to the Institute of Design and made it what it is today. So welcome to ID. Welcome to the 85th anniversary of I the Institute of Design. And with that, I want to welcome the panelists, Ashley Lukasik, Alec Nawala Lee, Todd Cook, and Tanner Woodford. Thank you so much for joining. And over to you, Tanner.
Thank you so much, Anisio. And I also just want to thank the Institute of Design for empowering us to put together this exhibition and supporting us all along the way. It's been such an enormous undertaking. I'm so proud of what we pulled together and really excited to share it with you all. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the exhibition before jumping into the panel. Uh, true to the character of ID, our celebration of the school's stunning legacy seeks to launch an even more stunning future. I think, Anijo, you really talked well about that, and that's, that's sort of how we've thought about the exhibition as we've been put, putting it together. Um, we've partnered uh, with the Institute of Design in order, in order to organize an original exhibition called ID at 85, 85 Years of Making the Future, which uses 85 key stories to demonstrate the vital role of design and ID in improving everyday life, from gas stations to space stations, camping shelters to an app for urban explorers, a better bar of soap to a doable reimagining of water resources for food, energy, and manufacturing. The breadth of work that's come out of the school for the past 85 years is really something. And you know, there were 16 of us uh, organized, uh, that worked together to organize the exhibition. If you're in the room and you worked on the exhibition, can you raise your hand? Thank you, and Marty Thaler, I hope your hand is really high because you've done so much work on the design of the show, and I'm so grateful to you for that as well. Um, let's give a round of applause to Marty, too. And And Sue Jeeth and William as well. I need to call it the student, two student workers that also had such an in integral hand in it too. So thank you all. So the work from the show, as Anijo mentioned, is or organized around four key eras. Experimentation, systems, human-centered design, and the era in process, which we're still trying to name. We're in the weeds with it now. Um, so I wanted to quickly introduce our panelists and then let you all sort of introduce yourselves as well a little bit and then I'll get into some questions I have. Um, I would very much like for you all to ask questions as well toward the end of the exhibition, so, uh, sorry, toward the end of the program. Um, so think of questions if you have them. Um, first off, I'll introduce you to Todd Cook to my right, who is a former student here, got his MDES and MBA in 2020 and was a research lead on 100 Great Designs, which I want to hear more about. Um, Alec Naval Ali is author of uh, Inventor of the Future, The Visionary Life of Buckminster Fuller, which just came out on HarperCollins in August of this year. So a really exciting time for you. Fantastic book. I need to read it much more deeply, but really have, have, have enjoyed it. And then Ashley Lukasik on the end, former employee of the Institute of Design and producer of the new Bauhaus film, which if you haven't seen, you need to rush home and watch immediately. Um, it's such good background for the exhibition and the school itself. And then just to reintroduce myself, I'm Tanner Woodford, founder and executive director of the Design Museum of Chicago and an organizer of ID at 85. So that's all of us. Um, could, we, could you all just kind of go down the row here and tell us more about yourself, your work, and just how you got interested in ID in the first place? Sure. Um, so, currently I'm a managerial senior consultant at Kaiser Permanente, where I'm leading a lot of human-centered design initiatives. Um, but the way I got to ID, um, I, I kind of want to give homage to um, the great introduction uh, that we heard because I was really captivated by the story of ID. Um, and I was amazed and aghast at how little had been done to uh, categorize it, to, to tell it, to share it outside of ID. Um, I was working at Knoll, uh, Herman Miller, um, and a fashion uh, startup. That was kind of my professional career before coming to ID. Um, but I was fascinated to learn that Massimo Vignelli was here, Buckminster Fuller was here, you know, you had Aaron Siskind, you had Jay Doblin, you had Patrick Whitney, you had Chuck Owen, you had all of these incredible figures who made huge contributions, Nathan Lerner. These names have, whether you know them or not, or whether you know their work or not, they are in the environment and in the world. And one of the things that was sort of painful for me as a former Slavic language and literature major was um, the lack of interest in these stories of the past. Um, and seeing where design has come and how we got here. Uh, you know, I think Johnny Ive said something similar. Designers are so focused on the future 
that they often forget to look back. And it's just such a privilege to be joining all of you who are all such gifted storytellers in different modalities. You know, we have filmmaking, we have uh, uh, books and, 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 and biographies, and we have curatorial. It's, it's, just, it's just an immense privilege to be among you. So that's my lengthy introduction. So um, I first encountered ID through my interest in Buckminster Fuller, and I've been writing this biography, working on this biography for the past four years. And the reason I wanted to write Fuller's story is that, number one, I was a big fan. And number two, you know, until now, the biographies that were available about Fuller tended to be fairly uncritical, and they tended to accept his version of events. And, and Fuller, you know, among other things, he was a myth maker. You know, he was someone who deliberately shaped the narrative of his career to achieve his objectives. And if you go back and look at his actual, you know, letters, his correspondence, other primary sources, you know, the story is, is often very different. And, and one example of this is that Fuller, um, you know, he was famous for embodying this ideal that he referred to as the comprehensivist, as the comprehensive designer, which was, you know, a, a individual who could um, combine the roles of the engineer, the architect, the designer, the economist, and, and one person. And it made him sound very uh, self-sufficient. But if you look at his actual uh, you know, life story, Fuller depended upon his collaborators. He especially um, relied on his students. And, and this is a story that is um, you know, kind of elided in the official account of his career. But um, it's really in 48, first at Black Mountain College in North Carolina, and then here at ID, that Fuller uh, realizes the potential of his students who end up doing incredible work for him and developing his designs, especially uh, the geodesic dome. And even though he was only here for, for one year, essentially, it was a pivotal part of his, his story and, and one that, um, you know, without the associates that he first encountered here, uh, you know, I think the story of his life would be very different. So I'm really looking forward to talking about that more tonight. Thanks. So um, anyway, love, love the introduction so far as well. Um, so I'm, my, I'm Ashley Lukasik. My company designs immersive experiences and we, um, we produce multimedia content and we do strategy work with our clients. Um, but all of that is grounded in human-centered design and really everything that I do now is actually, actually began as projects here at the Institute of Design where I spent eight years um, largely in a role where I was facilitating projects and research that would introduce large organizations to human-centered design as a way to solve problems or open up new markets. And, and this was under the mentorship of, of Patrick Whitney, who was the, the dean at the time. Um, and we spent a lot of time you know, as a staff and a faculty constantly thinking about where is design going, um, what is design accountable to, what should we be thinking about today, and, um, you know, it's my, my feeling is that in order to, to really consider and reflect deeply on where you're going, you need to think about where you've been. Um, and so that was one of the motivations to create the new Bauhaus film, which then turned me into an accidental filmmaker. Um, so, yeah. I'd love to keep you talking, <laughs> so I'm curious. One of the things I love about the film is that it's, so, it's rooted in history, but it feels so contemporary. And I'm curious if you could tell us more about Maholi's idea of community and what some of the parallels are to community today and what, what you've noticed sort of um, in doing your research. Mm -hmm. I mean, like design work is, is inherently collaborative. Um, I know that here at ID, if organizations like hire a student from ID, they're oftentimes, it's oftentimes recommended to them that they hire more than one because this work cannot be done in isolation. And Maholi, unlike some of his peers in the art and architecture and design world of the time, was like definitely not that kind of like solitary genius archetype. He was super, super collaborative. Um, and he basically started this school out of, kind of from scratch and basically just invited anyone who was interested in coming to come. And so, um, you know, I think the film that we made is, is really about how the creative process makes the person. Um, Maholi said something like, the, um, not the product, but the human is the end in sight. Um, and so 
I think that that is all very true, but that creative process is something that is like very much about not just your own identity and, and how you are formed through your creative process, but how you do that via community and being a part of a community and collaboratively. I, I love that. And that's that sense of community certainly is still with in the school. I think when we put together the exhibition, it would have been very easy to say, hey, Design Museum, can you come in and put together this exhibition? But that wasn't the case. It was, here's a group of faculty and students who all have great ideas. We're going to do crits following this to dig deeper into the content, figure out what's missing, and then do a phase two to improve it. And that a whole idea of collaboration does feel so sort of steeped into the school. Um, Todd, can you tell me about curriculum and the curriculum model and how that, because I think there's the collaboration, but there's also the, the structure underneath. How has the curriculum changed uh, over the years and, and is it still linked to the Bauhaus? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question and one that uh, I will have to cut short because it's covering, you know, almost 85 years of, of continuous iteration and change. Um, so the curriculum was born um, as a carbon copy of the Bauhaus wheel that Walter Gropius developed um, when he was in, um, when he was leading the, the Bauhaus in Germany. Um, and when Maholi was invited, actually it was not Maholi who was invited to found uh, uh, ID by Norma Stahl, it was in fact Gropius who had recently just taken a teaching position at Harvard. Um, this was after, you know, the rumblings of World War II were beginning and, and everyone was fleeing from, from Germany. Um, and he said, you know, I, I can't do it, but, you know, I couldn't think of a better person to, to lead your institution than, um, than Laszlo Mahoy Nash. And uh, Laszlo was kind of an, a strange pick uh, of, the, of the coterie. Um, and you really get into this quite well in your film, which if you haven't seen it, you should watch it. Um, but, you know, uh, Walter Gropius uh, invited Maholi to this lake house to kind of talk a little bit about this uh, opportunity. Um, this was also funded by Chicago in, in, uh, industry magnets. So they were looking to develop something like the Bauhaus that produced finished products that could be sold. Um, and in, 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 this is something that was very difficult for, for Laszlo to really kind of lead because he was so focused on the process, so focused on the student's individual learning, and he didn't really care about the end product. Um, and so this led to uh, a lot of consternation among the school's kind of early founders. Um, the main, so, so it was a carbon copy. Um, initially, they said, we'll just take, you know, and, and adapt it. Um, so you can see the original ring, I believe, in the exhibition upstairs. Um, once Laszlo came and after a couple years of, of um, kind of finding his footing, uh, one of the major changes that he made was he added a, a light program, um, which is kind of strange, I think, for most people, like a light program in a design school, that doesn't really make sense, but he really thought of it as the missing formal element of the Bauhaus curriculum, which was all based around materials, and he's like, light is the most essential material, and he was thinking about this from the perspective of photography. Photography is an ocular medium. It's one that relies on light, filters light. Um, but he was also thinking about it from a sculptural perspective and a three-dimensional perspective. Um, this really laid the groundwork for what became, you know, the preeminent uh, photography school in the U.S. for a period of time. Uh, you know, Aaron Siskin, Callahan, like there's so many great photographers here. There's still, you can go and look at books um, on this. So that was the, the first major um, addition that he made in addition to the, the product um, interiors and graphic programs that were building off of the original curriculum that um, uh, Gropius designed. Once, you know, try to quickly elide once Doblin came in, so Maholi died uh, in 46. There was a period of nine years where everyone was trying to figure out what to do. The school got acquired by what had just become IIT, former, formerly uh, Armour Institute of Technology. Mies was now leading the architecture program. Um, and Doblin came in and he kind of, he was a professional, he was a working professional. He was someone who had been working at Raymond Lau with Raymond Lauer for 15 
um, years, and he was really trying to make design less of a line operation where designers are handed things to render and to, to make, um, and make them more involved in the strategic process about what should we build and why should we build it, and for whom and why. Um, and photography didn't really fit in his kind of vision for that, so kind of got uh, cut a little bit, and he really started thinking much more systematically, much more strategically, thinking a lot about consumer profiles. He was someone who was motivated by, you know, taxonomy and categorizing and, 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 and that. So he made a lot of changes to the curriculum based on that model, um, and, you know, we've continued to iterate on this, you know, um, our, our current um, uh, leadership is continually referencing these different iterations while kind of focusing on things like human advocacy, you know, uh, you know, more prescient things like ESG and DEI that have kind of, you know, increasingly become ways that we're thinking about what we're designing and for whom. So that was a long answer. I really apologize, but it's hard to cover a hundred year curriculum change, but yeah. No apologies needed. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, Alec, I want to get you in here as well. So we, we kind of brushed right through the Fuller period, and I want to ask you uh, about two objects in particular that are in the show, the um, Dymaxion tent and the aut autonomous dwelling unit. Before I do that, part A is, can you just put some context around Fuller's time here? When was he here? What was he working on? And, and, um, and yeah, what, what, did, what do you know about Fuller's time at ID? Yeah, so the context here is actually very important. So Fuller gets the invitation uh, to come lecture here in the fall of 47, all right? And at this point, Fuller is 52 years old, which I think is interesting to note. And he is essentially on his own. Um, so for the previous 20 years, he has been a public figure, he has been advocating for his vision of housing, and he's never really gotten traction. And his most recent attempt to realize these ideas uh, took place in Wichita, Kansas, and he actually received funding to build a prototype of you know, what he calls the Damaxian dwelling machine, which is sort of this um, circular round house. Looks kind of like, like a flying saucer, you know, that's landed in this, uh, this field. And it's, a, you know, an incredible looking uh, design, but the company fails in large part because of Fuller's interpersonal issues with his partners. And he comes back to New York kind of humiliated. You know, he has acquired a reputation for, uh, you know, justifiably being hard to work with. And he has no real prospect of raising money for, on, that, on that scale ever again. Um, and so uh, he receives an invitation from Serge Chermayev, am I saying that correctly, uh, who at the time was the director of, the, of ID, uh, to come lecture. And uh, at first he turns it down, all right? And, and I think it's interesting because he claims that he charges you know, $500 per lecture. Uh, which is more than the ID can afford. And in practice, you know, he's very willing to uh, settle for less. But I think in this case, he is a little bit ambivalent about coming here because he sees ID as his peers and he feels embarrassed. He feels as though he has failed in Wichita in a very public way. And it takes some persuasion before he's eventually uh, convinced to come out here for, for a lecture for $100. And uh, you know, the lecture goes well. It's in January of 48. And uh, Chermayev says, you know, you should come out here again and teach in the fall uh, of 48, which, which he agrees to do. So what happens in the meantime is in the spring of 48, Fuller, again, he has almost nothing, you know, uh, in, in the way of resources. He, he's working out of the uh, New York uh, studio of George Nelson, who is a major figure in modernist design. Um, and his primary interest at this point is geometry. And so he's building these geometrical constructions essentially at his dining room table. And one day he realizes that you can build a hemisphere out of uh, triangular elements, all right? And, and um, this comes out of these geometrical explorations that he's been working on. And, and this is, you know, eventually what becomes the geodesic dome. Um, and, and it's important for a couple of reasons. It, it has obvious design advantages. You know, it's a hemisphere, so it encloses the maximum interior space with the minimum surface area. Um, you know, it's a clear span structure without any internal supports. But the key thing for Fuller is that this is a design that he can prototype for almost nothing. You know, so the Damaxian uh, dwelling machine was a big industrial operation that required essentially an aircraft factory. And with uh, the dome, he can go to the hardware store and buy some sticks and some string and some wire and build something himself. The, uh, the first prototypes were actually made of Venetian blinds. And, um, you know, Fuller makes like a four-foot model 
uh, that looks you know compelling enough uh, you know to get some interest from uh, from companies. And his first stop is uh, Black Mountain College in North Carolina, which is a you know famous program, obviously. And and you know one one of the things that Fuller does there uh, in the summer session uh, is try to build a dome. And uh, his design, and this is the only dome that Fuller designs himself in the entire course of his career, is essentially based on Venetian blind strips. So these are strips that, of, of you know thin aluminum that. Um, you know, they, they follow the great circles of the hemisphere. So they are curved members, all right? They're flexible members. Um, and this is important because when he tries to build the first dome, the first full-size dome, which I think is supposed to be 50 feet across, it totally fails. Uh, it's just a big pile of nothing. You know, it, it's supposed to ascend magically into the air as they, as, as they assemble this uh, structure in a field, and it just kind of lies there. And, and he claims it later that he meant to fail, or that you know he managed to resurrect the dome afterward. But there's no evidence that this is true. It, it's clearly, you know, a failed design. And to me, this is very interesting because when Fuller arrives at ID in the fall of '48, he has some models. He has the idea for the dome, but he does not have a dome. And nine months later, when he leaves, he has a dome. And, and the reason is the students. He, he encounters students here who actually have the practical experience that he needs to actually realize this. And they make certain changes. You know, they um, realize that maybe instead of using these curved members, we can kind of do like a ticker toy arrangement with these struts, which ends up being much more stable and much more practical. And these are people, you know, and, and Fuller, you know, he is kind of guiding them, he is lecturing, he is giving them uh, design prompts. but. The students are the ones who actually are the ones realizing it. So I think that's a very, a very important point, and, and this will become important to his career later on. But I want to quickly talk about the two things that you mentioned, because this is actually a very interesting um, uh, episode. So if you go up to the exhibition uh, here, you'll see two photographs. Uh, one is of what is called the Damaxian umbrella, and one is what is referred to in the caption as, I believe, the autonomous dwelling unit. So the Damaxian umbrella, um, Oh, actually, I'm going to backtrack one second here. So, so Fuller has been talking about housing since the 20s, and one of his initial insights is that he wants to build a house that is lightweight, that can be transported anywhere in the country. And he, he basically says, well, if you have a house, you can divide it into two elements. There is the enclosure, which is like a shell that protects you from the elements, and there are the utilities, so the kitchen and the bathroom and, and so on. And, and his, his insight is that you can separate these two things. You can build a shell that is very light, that you can build out of tension materials or metal or plastic, you know, so that it's very lightweight. And then you can have a separate core where the bathroom and the kitchen and all your utilities are kind of in one, what he later calls a black box. And if you have that little black box and the shell over the top, that's a house. And you can optimize this house by treating these two elements separately. So when you go look at the exhibit, that's what he's doing here. He has the Damaxian umbrella, which is the shell part, and he has the autonomous uh, dwelling unit, which is the utility core. And he actually assigns both things to the students. And the short version of what happens is that the shell, the dome, succeeds incredibly well. Like, they are able to build this, like, really compelling 14-foot in diameter dome that looks great, that he is able to take to Black Mountain, famously, uh, and, and set up there. And it ends up being a lot harder to make the utilities. It's a lot harder to make a bathroom and a kitchen that will fit into the space that he uh, envisions. And so what happens is that after he leaves ID, he kind of forgets about the utilities. He, you know, he, he, he says, well, here's the shell. The shell, he, he spins off the shell as its own thing. And so for Fuller, for the next 10 years, you know, he is selling the dome to the government, to corporations, to all these clients. And, you know, and you look at this and you're like, well, okay, he has the shell. It's a cool looking device, but it's not a house yet. You know, he never cracks the problem of the utilities. And it's this kind of funny thing where it just kind of gets erased. You know, he says the dome was the whole point. The dome was my intention, you know, this entire time. But in fact, it's because, you know, he, the challenge of making the utility core was so great that the only surviving, uh, you know, um, instance of it is the model that you see in these photographs. It's, it, was, it was a great idea, and he, he had students build these, you know, like nice little models of how it would look. But in practice, you know, he tried for years to, to develop that part of the house, and he never actually did. Um, and I guess, like, I'll, I'll end by saying that um, 
if you want to see a picture of the dome shell that he built, or that, you know, more accurately, his students built, there are amazing pictures, uh, and they're all taken at Black Mountain College. And so people tend to incorrectly assume that the dome was actually developed at Black Mountain. And this is not true. It was developed by students from ID who actually traveled to Black Mountain to set up that dome. And the question is, why has this episode been essentially removed from Fuller's life story? You know, because you read previous books about Fuller, and they talk about Black Mountain for pages, and they almost, you know, mention ID as an aside. And I think it's because Fuller knew that the story of um, Black Mountain was, you know, him as this visionary teacher, you know, kind of among peers like John Cage and Willem de Kooning. And the story of ID is about the students. And I think Fuller was not comfortable with that narrative. I, I think the students in the story who end up playing a big part in his career later on, they get removed in a way that I think is very deliberate. I appreciate you opening the Black Mountain door. And Ashley, do you know more about Black Mountain and the relationship between Black Mountain and ID? I think we've talked about it a few times over the years. Not, Not enough to get into, but that's fine. No. My real Sorry. question for you is Apologies. about, no, I didn't mean to throw you a curveball. I told you explicitly I wouldn't do that, and now I am. Um, my question for you is more about uh, ID's relationship with corporate America. And I think sort of um, back in the day when Moholy was founded the school, what was that? What were those relationships like? How are these? How did these projects come to be? And then working here more more recently too, you know, I, I've been really excited to see the work with the city of Chicago and all of these different organizations over the years. And can you just talk more about how students ha work with with um, uh, corporate partners? Sure. So to start on the Moholy side, um, you know, when Moholy came here, I was like essentially the school was shut down and then he was in this process of like constant fundraising which made him a really um, sometimes unpopular like party guest like, people found him a little bit obnoxious but what he eventually landed on was this like there was this patron in the Pepkis you know they were they became patrons of his work um, so the container corporation and that's what really ended up sustaining the school um, but like, you know, initially it was like very experimental. It was really more of an art school and it was hard for industry folks to really understand it. Um, but eventually like, you know, via the war and all these other things, there, there started to be more of these kind of like real world industry applications and partnerships that developed. And that's where you see in the exhibition, there's some stuff about the camouflage design courses that were taught and that kind of thing. Um, I guess like, you know, and, and ID during the time that I was here, we had lots and lots of partnerships. I mean, lots of corporate partnerships, but also lots of partnerships with other kinds of civic organizations um, as well. Um, and I think, you know, it's, what's always kind of interesting to me is the way that design constantly like toggles be between what is this kind of like ephemeral unknown, you know, experimental space, which you could call art and then this pragmatic, applied, um, kind of economically purposeful space, which you could call business. And it's like, it's, it's a debate that I think we like, can, have, have had since the, big, since the school was founded and is sort of like ebbs and flows through the different eras in different ways. And as you were talking, I was just kind of like thinking to myself, you know, how do you like, how do you strike a balance or do you strike a balance? Do you just let there be these like sort of extremes and let people sort of follow their nature in one extreme and somehow the, the collective um, of these different creative minds finds some kind of a medium? But anyway, um, that's a little bit of an aside. I guess like the only other thing I would say about it is I think, um, you know, design is in a place now where having, you know, really like caught up with corporate America you have to start asking, like, is, does, it need to, does it need to start pushing itself further and maybe push against that to some extent? Because some of that has led to some, some, some really toxic things. You know. can, I, can I pick Please. up on that conversation? Yeah. Um, so I think just to follow this story a little bit, um, you know, when, when the Bauhaus was started, you know, it was based on this idea of we can use modern technology to create cost-effective uh, beautiful products for consumers. The thing that everyone always forgets is that whatever, everything that the Bauhaus produced was expensive and not generally quite cheap to manufacture. 
Um, and uh, that kind of got cemented when the Bauhaus was lionized and then adopted by corporations like Knoll. If you go back and look at the price books, a lot of these were pretty premium offerings. Um, so this kind of debate starts very early in the professionalization and the founding of design. What, what Maholi would produce and showcase to his corporate sponsors, they would call like thingamajigs. Like they had no idea how to produce them, for what purpose. They were these artistic kind of outputs. Um, and then yes, as, as the, the war mobilization effort started, that's kind of when the school started to find its rhythm. Um, I'm not gonna speak to the Serge Chermayev interim period between Maholi and Doblin, which was like a nine year period that you know Alec can speak a lot better to. Um, but just kind of alighting that, what Jay was really brought, Jay Doblin, so Jay was brought in in 1955. He was a commercial designer. He was working at the time for Raymond Lowy, Lowy, I'm not entirely even sure how to pronounce the name, forgive me. Um, he had worked for him for 15 years. He had worked for Coca-Cola, Frigidaire, you know, all the big chic, you know, all the big commercial clients. And when he was appointed, the school, uh, the students, the faculty, the administrators were in open revolt. They were like, you're going to destroy this great fledgling culture that we've created with this crass commercial hack. That's what they called him. And, um, you know, he, he, he came into it, he kind of leaned into that, he embraced it, and he, um, he did have a vision for a, a kind of commercialization and a professionalization of design that he was going to push, but he wasn't going to do that at the full expense of art and creativity and experimentation. Um, and I think that that's something that sometimes gets lost in talking about his legacy. But Doblin, Doblin was really frustrated as a professional designer with the fact that, you know, he was saying, you know, we're basically just participating in this kind of consumerist economy um, where we're not thinking critically about what we're building and why we're building it. And he thought that the way to do that was to elevate design within the corporate structure such that designers are making more strategic decisions about what to build and why. And that was really his vision for the school. Um, and for that, he needed really good clients. Um, Amoco, uh, Amoco the, um, the aluminum company was one, you know, Shell Gas, he, he worked with. Um, but again, to get to the point about the, the, the harm in, in kind of just taking any corporate client, this included Kent Cigarettes. Um, you know, he designed the, the trademark uh, True filter tip for um, this, this brand called True uh, in collaboration with Chuck Owen. Um, but the, again, for him it was a means to an end. And um, with the kind of human-centered design era, we start to ask a little bit more questions. And when you look at the kind of makeup that come of, of uh, sponsors that come to ID now, a lot more of them are civic, a lot more of them are socially minded. You know, we've done uh, community projects here. Uh, I, you know, Chris Rudd, I see Chris Rudd here when uh, doing a lot of great work with community outreach and organizing. Um, so design is continuing to sort of navigate this conversation and thinking about what clients, for what purpose, and for whom. And I think that design is gonna to continue to go that way um, as we go forward. And, you know, um, where's Carlos? Carlos was here, um, led a great project on the, with the Greater Food um, uh, Purchasing Program, uh, thinking about food distribution um, by a bunch of different organizations, including Chicago Public Schools. So it, it's something that has a long history and a very fraught history and one that we will continue to revisit again and again because it's a tough nut to crack. And there's no right way to do it no. either. And this might be an obvious question and anybody can answer, but why is it important for a classroom to have a client and what are the drawbacks from that? You know, is it important to have a space where you're thinking freely and experimenting without constraints of a client or is it important to have, to kind of go up against sort of real world constraints? Wow, I mean, certainly, 
having a client and knowing that, that it's, a, it's, a real, it's a real thing you have to present to people that are outside of your bubble makes it very tangible and makes it really, I mean, the stakes are higher, right? Like, you know, so I mean, I think that that's, it's, I mean, I think that's incredible experience for students who are learning. But there's, again, you know, there are many classes that you take, you know, at the Institute of Design and elsewhere that are not where you don't have a client. So I think they do get a, I think the students get a good mix of the two. It just feels like such a clear distinction between ID and a lot of other schools who might look at design as art, might look at design as experimentation over time and that sort of thing. And it, I think it does raise the stakes in a really interesting way and also prepares you for the real world once you leave the school as well. Do you have a perspective on that, Alec? I mean, as usual, my, my thoughts are filtered through Fuller's story. And I think actually he's an interesting example because he tends to downplay the fact that he pursued clients really aggressively throughout his entire career. You know, like toward the end of his life, he kind of um, tries to present himself as this detached uh, developer of ideas, you know, who's just trying to experiment and just trying to get these things out into the world. But, you know, you, you look at his life and he is going after corporate clients, the government, the military, in an incredibly um, ambitious and deliberate way. And, and I think it's actually very interesting because, you know, one thing that um, I talk about is that the dome is a structure that can be designed and built in a college seminar. So in theory, you could simply approach it as a design problem. And I think that's kind of how he framed it to his students. So he would go to a college for six weeks and he would say, here's an idea, you know, here's your design prompt. And the students would try to build the dome that he had in mind. And often it was a dome that used a certain kind of material like plywood or, or plastic, or it was a dome that spun around to like shed the elements, you know, you know these like fairly wild ideas that, that students were developing. And then he takes these ideas, and number one, he takes them to the next college on his list, so he seems like he is this renaissance man who is, you know, somehow coming up with all these, these ideas, which are in fact really being developed in a practical way by the students from the previous seminar. But he's also approaching clients like the Marines. He's approaching, uh, you know, the U.S. government, and he actually has his only real success with the Dome. Uh, you know, making things like ray domes, uh, which are which are you know made uh, for the Department of Defense as enclosures for radars in the Arctic Circle, um, and you know as as trade pavilions and, and you know all these things, and, and when he talks to those clients, his pitch is essentially the dome is a tool of American supremacy in the Cold War. You know, this is this is what we're going to use as kind of like a um, instrument of soft power, you know, to to advance our objectives in the U.S. But when he talks to his students, that is not the message, all right? Especially later on, because he, he reaches his biggest you know, audience, and, and I want to talk about this because you know, his greatest influence is actually out of the late 60s, where people like Stuart Brand, who founds the Horth Catalog, the hippies in Drop City, you know, who are building domes for communes, you know, these are kind of counterculture figures. These, these are people who are trying to experiment and are, and are trying to get these ideas out. And, what I think is a relatively more pure way, you know, they're, they're trying to make the dome open source and they're publishing these mimeographed, you know, like guides to, to the dome called Dome Book and the Dome Cookbook, you know, in a way that I think is actually really exciting. And Fuller is actually very ambivalent towards this. He does not want these ideas, which he sees as his property, to be shared in the way that a lot of his followers do. But what I find really interesting is that, you know, sometime in the mid-60s, you know, his message changes. You know, this is a man who, for the previous, you know, 10 years, had been selling the dome to the military and to the U.S. Marines. And after a while, you know, those clients dry up. He can't really get commissions anymore from, from that audience. And so he, he decides to pivot. He still needs college kids to build these domes and kind of do these projects for him. And so his message becomes one of ensuring universal uh, prosperity for mankind. You know, like making sure that the world works for everyone. And this is a big change. You know, th this is not what he says t to the U.S. Marines, but it is what he says at San Jose State College, you know, when he talks there. And so all these phases, you know, in, in, Hul in Fuller's, uh, you know, uh, career, you know, they seem very different. But the real question is, who is the client? Like, who is the client at any given time? Right? And when the client is the government, you know, he speaks you know, uh, in one way. And when the client is essentially the university system, and especially the sort of this countercultural, anarchic group of uh, students who are very idealized and who have very different objectives, his message uh, changes accordingly. I want to contribute to this conversation by talking about both and, kind of. Um, so, you know, the curriculum today, um, 
we're given the freedom to experiment. And in, you know, in my case, I went through a year of foundation, which was really no client was attached to any of the work that I was doing. I was learning the craft. I was learning form. I was learning color. I was learning um, all the different attributes that designers have to think about context, audience, um, use cases, uh, use case of something not in use. Um, these are really essential skills and you, it, it can be difficult to learn them when you're working for a client. Um, and so I think uh, IDEA is really intentional about creating spaces for both because you learn things working with a client and you learn things without working with a client. And I think too often when we talk about IDEA's history, uh, you know, the way that it, it gets reduced or simplified is that Maholi was the, the, the artist, he was more expressionistic, experimentation sort of, sort of left his clients holding the bag, paying for something that they couldn't actually use. Um, but Moholy really wanted a lot of these things to be produced. I mean, you can see it in his work. He was designing packaging, he was designing, you know, um, the camouflage project, he was designing interiors. He, he really wanted things to have a real world application. Um, similarly, I think, you know, uh, you know, Doblin is often pitted, I think, unfairly against Maholi um, as, I mean, and he did criticize aspects of Maholi. He said some of his solutions were ridiculous, including a bed spring that, that he developed for the U.S. Army. Um, but, but Doblin was also, uh, a, you know, he studied at Pratt, which was one of the first industrial design schools in the U.S., and he brought uh, an exercise called line plane volume, um, which was developed by uh, a really great um, female uh, uh, leader whose name I am forgetting, and I have to ask Marty to chime in on it. Um, but it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an exercise in which you have a line, you have a plane, and you have a volume, and you have to make an aesthetically pleasing object. And that's, those are the only requirements and there's a relationship between dominant and subdominant forms. You're thinking about planes and, and perspective. Um, and he brought that here. And that, that has continued to be a formal, experimental, abstract assignment that we continue to do this day because it's such a good, uh, it's such a good assignment. And, um, you know, so for as much, Many people like, like to think of Doblin as this kind of commercialist, but he really, and with his clients, he often created spaces for experimentation to discover, and he always knew that I have to somehow tie this into the client's objective, but I also have to give designers the space to explore the problem really robustly. And I think that that's something that design really does really well to this day, and something that it, uh, it continues to negotiate. And I would add to that, too, that in many of the projects that I either helped facilitate or observed during my time at the Institute of Design, and I'm sure this is still true, with corporate partners, a lot, of, a lot of what the faculty who were leading that were trying to do was, was to um, provide that kind of insight and, and, and actually spread those ethos to those corporate partners to say, hey, like if you actually want to do things differently, if you want to solve problems in a different way, um, provide better services, be more ethical, be more sustainable, or whatever it might be, then you need to provide those spaces for experimentation and failure. And so there was a lot of discussion around, you know, of course, like organizations redesigning themselves um, by having some kind of a, a access to a model they could maybe follow. And just to give a concrete example of that, to kind of put a finer point on this with Doblin, because it's something that doesn't get talked about enough. You know, um, when he was working for Unimark, which was a huge graphic design company, I mean, it gave us uh, Helvetica, it gave us, you know, uh, the, these, you know, bold typefaces, but he, he worked for a client who wanted to design a stadium. And, um, Doblin was effectively barred from the room because he said, you know, and a lot of times you have to challenge the brief. A, cl a client comes and says, we think we want this. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the time as a good designer, you have to figure out a way to get the client to question their premise and open up their thinking in a more broad way. 
and the, the, the kind of, to conclude this story with, with Jay Doblin, you know, he was like, it's, a stadium is such an inefficient way to create a, a spectator experience. It creates so much waste, it creates so much energy. We have this great thing called the television that has no bandwidth like limitations. I mean, he was a little optimistic on that. You know, we can think about that now in terms of the internet. But he, he's right in many ways. Like, we, you know, if you look at the history of what stadiums do to cities, it's a very fraught one. And, you know, he would challenge this thinking and, um, you know, a lot of people kind of had to tone him down a little bit. Um, but yeah, I think it's a, a good example of that. Thanks everybody, that was really great to kind of hear it from many perspectives. Um, I think we have time for probably two questions from the audience. Is there anybody that has a burning question they'd like to ask? I have more if not, but I feel like somebody probably does. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'll repeat it just for folks that are listening virtually. Um, what excites you about the future of ID? And I think all three of you could answer, or anybody. anybody. I mean, I'll just say I'm like I'm 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 super encouraged about where the school is today. Being here, I mean, for one thing, it's really fantastic to see this exhibition. Like, this is something that people who have been part of this school have have wanted to see for a really long time. Um, so that is just great. I'm really pleased that that's come together. But I think that the way that a lot of the work that's being done around thinking about design for infrastructure, really thinking a lot more critically, a lot of the work that Chris has, has, has done and that's being carried through with other faculty with like the anti-racist design stuff, like all of that stuff is really, um, feels like some, some long overdue um, domains that the school is moving into that I think is very welcome. I think I'll come back to the of, of collaboration, which has you know come up a few times um, tonight. Because you know I've spent um, you know much of my career thinking about these charismatic figures, and I, I, I'm actually kind of curious, you know, if people have thoughts about this. You know, why does design tend to produce people like this? You know, these visionaries, these these kind of um, messianic types who tend to draw attention to themselves, and you know, I, I, I you know. One of the things that I learned writing this book is that I think uh, our goal as a society should be to move past the need for figures like this uh, to kind of organize things and to make things happen and to produce things and to oversee things. I think, um, you know, there, there's a lot of danger there in, in investing too much of our energy and our uh, attention into one individual. And from what I've seen here, you know, this seems like a great place for true collaboration to take place. I, I think that is the future of design and especially of uh, how the way technology affects people's lives. And, and, you know, everything that I've seen here makes me think that this would be a good place for that to take uh, place. I think uh, one of the things that really excites me, you know, there's, a, there's an idea that's been talked about a lot as of the T-shaped designer. Um, so the T-shaped designer is someone who is, can go horizontal and broad across a lot of different considerations, economics, form, social factors, et cetera, and also go really deep into those categories. And I think for me, um, I, I think ID is uniquely, uh, in both in terms of its history, it's, it's experimented with both ways, going really broad, going really deep, and it's really thinking about how to kind of uh, find the ideal intersection point between those two things. And to, to piggyback on what Alec was saying, um, you know, Doblin is a really complicated figure. It's been really tough for me to research him. There's some things that, um, are, are, are difficult to read that he's written um, that don't, to me, stand up. And I, and I, and, and, but I think one of the things that he really was frustrated with 
was this, this, this messianic designer. And in some ways, he kind of was one, which is kind of where he's, he's a little bit problematic, but he, his mission was to, to make it more difficult for someone like a, a Raymond Lowy uh, to come into an organization and have an opinion on everything from the way that and it could be an arbitrary opinion. It could be his personal taste. He wanted things to have a reason, a rationale, a structure that could be understood by multiple people. And he, he wanted to de-emphasize the designer as creator. And he wanted to instead emphasize the designer as, as a strategic thinker and thinking about the needs of society. And um, you know, for all the commercial work that he did, to me, reading his legacy, that was a, a very... That's, that's, that's just, it's through the whole thing. And I think it sometimes gets missed. And I think that the pivot post Doblin from into human-centered design really encapsulates that. And I think it's been, um, you know, it's, it's with mixed feelings, I think, uh, that I've seen these uh, ideas that I, I know the history of and I've seen developed and, and, and de develop incrementally over time get kind of packaged by, by some other, I won't name them, but other organizations and kind of serve them back up um, a, a, as a way without really giving uh, the collaborative credit that's due. And I think that uh, ID really is that collaborative culture. There, I did not work with a lot of egocentric designers. I did not work with, instead it's like, anytime I'm working on a problem, I don't think I have the solution. What I want to go do is talk to other people. I want to talk to my colleagues who have expertise that I don't have. And I want to talk to people who have different lived experiences and different perspectives and framings. I don't think there's a design school that's really right now orienting in that way. And to me, um, that's what really excites me about the future of ID. That's great. Um, are there any other burning questions? Yeah, go ahead. Yes. So the question was, what, what ties all these stories together, essentially? And then what's the thread between them? It's a hard question. <laughs> I mean, I have an opinion. I don't know if it's the answer to that question. But I think like when I first came to ID, I was kind of like, um, I guess a little bit blown away because I was like, oh, here's this place where there's like people like me who like love to live in a space of just kind of like the gray and the ambiguity and the mess and like, you know, roll it over in their minds in a million different ways. And yet like ID, like attracts people like that, but then it provides you with, with different methods and frameworks and tools that are ever evolving and changing to kind of like, a, a, to, to kind of actually get at it and do something with it. Um, and I think you could probably make an argument that that's been true, you know, across all of these eras and remains true today. I think, you know, for me, the connective thread here is the idea of design as an activity that has value that needs to be taught and scrutinized um, because it has an impact on people's lives. And, and if we don't talk about uh, how design is done and the best way to apply it, you know, in an ethical, you know, uh, compassionate way, you know, it can be used, it, design is a neutral uh, element in human life, right? It can be used for, for positive and for negative ends. Uh, I think with Fuller, his uh, view of technology was in some ways very uncritical, you know, and, and I think it's important that we move past the idea that every problem can be approached as a subset of design or engineering. But that said, you know, I think debating the role of design in human life and in society is, is crucial. And, and I think if, you know, those questions aren't asked and, and you know, if you don't try to find, uh, you know, good answers, um, you know, I think 
it, it can lead to problems. It can lead to um, you know issues that even uh, you know the most gifted designers from a technical standpoint you know can't foresee without that kind of debate. I think for me the thread that ties all of these stories together is a desire to question the core assumptions on which our practice is built. I mean, I think Moholy did that. I think Doblin did that. I think that uh, Patrick Whitney, I, I think the entire spirit of design to me is filled with people who are questioning, um, what do we mean when we say design? What is design? Who is design for? Um, you know, we have this proliferation of new forms of design, speculative design, designing futures, social design, um, behavioral design. You know, I, I don't know of another school that is adding as many kind of paths that you can pursue, um, and I think that's because of our history um, and because we've, we've, we've seen this, the evolution of this very young, discipline um, since its kind of inception. Um, and I think that we will never stop questioning that. And um, I think that, I think that it, it would be tough to come to ID. And admittedly, I think as a student when I came here, I had a notion of what design was. And I had to unlearn it and then learn new things about what design meant and what design could be. And I learned that through my peers, I learned that through my colleagues, I learned that through my clients. Um, and, um, you know, in some ways, when I came here with a background in fashion and art and design, you know, I wanted to make pretty things. You know, there was a part of me that wanted that. And I had to learn why a pretty thing is not always the right solution. Sometimes an ugly thing is a good thing. Um, you know, so I, I think that for me is sort of what ties this story together is one of continual questioning. I think that's a great place to end. And before we thank the panel, um, please join us upstairs to see the exhibition. I know I can speak for all three of you that we love answering questions, myself included. It's all four of us, I suppose. Feel free to continue to ask us questions upstairs. Um, and with that, you know, I do want to pass it back to Anisio. Before that happens, can you help me thank our wonderful panel, please? Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Another round for them. Thank you. So as Kristen and I were planning these events, we just opposed. We had uh, Patrick Whitney at the back of our, uh, you know, the voice of Patrick talk, telling us, don't just talk about the past. Don't just talk about it. Tell us what you're going to do in the future. So we just opposed two events. Today is about the past. This is about celebrating our heritage and our legacy. And on Friday, we are going to talk about our future. And that future is built on by faculty members who are actually building new tools and new frameworks for collaboration, some of whom are sitting right here. So join us on Friday uh, for lunch, uh, during lunch, uh, to listen to our, hear our faculty and how they are building new frameworks and tools for collaboration. And in the evening, I am actually going to be in conversation with Patrick Whitney and Daniel Barcha from the Moholy-Nagyen University in Hungary to talk about the future of design education. So please join us in the evening again on Friday. There will be libations, so that's a good uh, reason to come here. Um, in true ID fashion, our exhibition is a prototype. And because we are always in process, we wanted to make sure, we wanted to ensure that you understand it is not exhaustive. It is just extensive. And therefore, we want you to give us suggestions and feedback on what is missing. What work is, what did we miss? What are the projects that are not there today? And hashtag us on social media. Let us know what you thought about it. And give us feedback by scanning the uh, QR code. And I am 100% sure we are missing something. And your comments will help us get to that missing link. And who doesn't like birthday gifts? We do. So because it is our 85th anniversary, we have reopened our Giving Day portal for anybody who is interested in giving us a birthday gift. 
so that we can give that back to our students who are here today and ensure their future. And with that, I want to invite you all to join us in the kitchen at the back where we have cupcakes with 85 imprinted on them. So uh, for coffee, drinks, and cupcakes, thanks for everybody who joined us today. Thanks to the panelists. And welcome back to ID for everybody and at the 85th anniversary. Thank you. Thanks for everybody who joined online as well.